You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 112, The Dental Guys Book Club, part six, Zero Bone Loss Concepts by Tomas Linkovicus. How about the fixed partial denture implant restoration? Are you splinting your implants together? Are you checking for tension-free restorations? We discuss some interesting things that really we are changing in our practice because of this book this week on The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com to learn more today. Welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm John The Dental Guy. And I'm Wes The Dental Guy. And... I think we have our timing right. This episode is going to release the week of the Academy of Austin Integration meeting. And we fly out tomorrow, man. Yeah. If you're listening to this and we got our timing right, which I think we do, we'll be leaving tomorrow to fly out there. And uh, we've been talking about this for a couple of shows and say we're excited is, you know, an understatement. We think this meeting is going to be, you know, one of the best uh, lineups that we've seen. Um, and the amazing thing about this is the access that we're going to have to some of the biggest names in not just implant dentistry, but in dentistry in general. And we just got confirmation today that, uh, Frank Spear is going to be joining us, uh, Mm. for the, the, uh, uh, during the welcome welcome reception, reception, which happens Mm -hmm. on day one, Thursday. His talk ends at 520. Yep. And if you're in that talk, you want to make your way down to the show floor, right? To the to the welcome reception, which is around like all the booths and stuff. Yeah, it's in the, the exhi- it's in the exhibit hall. Exhibit hall. And you'll and see us down there. It'll be it'll should be pretty visible. But he's gonna be first right on immediately. Yeah. And and what a way to kick off the meeting uh, with our at our booth there at our uh, recording studio there in the exhibit hall, but with Frank Spear and John, you're nervous, aren't you? You're nervous. I I mean, I don't, you know, the thing is when we first started this, we said, Hey, what would be (laughs) a couple of the people who would, if we got on the show, we would feel like we finally made it, you know, and, and definitely (laughs) made it where though, (laughs) made it still sitting in a studio in Knoxville. Well, made it in the dental nerd world. (laughs) I'm just giving you a hard time. (laughs) (laughs) And, and one of them, of course, was was Frank Spear, and and so we, you know, when we got to have him on the show, it mm. was pretty surreal the first time, and so now we've talked to him a couple of times, and uh, you know, I, I feel like we have a good connection with him, and and so I, I think it's going to be a great conversation because he's going to be talking about, you know, I and I think this is a topic we've heard echoed from a couple. It's very interesting, yeah, that Ricardo Matrani himself, who teaches the terminal dentition seminar and workshop if you remember back on the show if you've if you haven't heard this you should go back and listen to this episode with us about kicking the beehive where it's a great episode by the way yeah Yeah. he talks about the fact that there's a lot of people that are treatment planning implants and putting everybody kind of into one treatment modality where maybe it would be something that uh you know really we should be looking at traditional tooth restorations or keeping teeth as a better alternative. And I think that Frank is going to be talking about maybe some of those same ideas as, you know, in today's, with today's implant technology, because the kind of the theme of the meeting is evolving technologies, you know, kind of what's next. How, how good are we with implants, but also how good have we come, have we, have we become at saving teeth and where do we need to be going? How do we make those decisions? That's, it's, it's a, it's something that Wes and I, I mean, Wes, we've, we've kind of, rethought a lot of things since we've been involved with spear education well so when you become a better restorative clinician and you understand uh globally what's going on with diseases and patients right i mean like like we're talking about like (laughs) it takes a little bit to become a doctor right i mean gosh Mm -hmm. you know you think hey if you're listening to this and you're in dental school right now 
you know, it is super exciting to put on that white coat, right? right? But but also I think about like how I felt back then. I felt pretty special and everybody does because some of the even the clinicians in the clinic in dental school would start calling you doc, right? I mean, right. like patients would call you doc before you'd even graduated. But I mean, what you you go through this transformation, I believe if you're on a journey of ever learning, right? And not everybody is. And ever some people just want to stay and just practice, you know, some just super simple bread and butter dentistry. And I have no problem with that at all. But if you go on this journey of next level, right? Right. right. What you start to see is you start to be able to see disease process, right? And I was just having this conversation today with a patient that comes in and he sits down and my assistant says, you know, it's been 16 years since this guy's been to the dentist. I look in his mouth immediately, and I'm thinking, man, he have ortho. No, he didn't. You know, I was like, man, you, you always try to compliment somebody. He's like great straight teeth. He's there for an emergency exam, tooth number 19. So here we go. We're having a discussion about root canal core and crown or extraction, right, mm -hmm. to get out of pain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then I'm also having this philosophical conversation with this gentleman and his wife who he wanted to get back. I mean, this guy's in his 30s, right? And I said, you know what? I'm a little concerned about you, and he admitted it to me, and you said it. I repeated what he said back to me, that I've never really made a commitment to dentistry. Mm -hmm. And she's like, yeah, he hasn't. And it wasn't like they were putting each other down. It was a really good conversation. Yeah. So when you start having these conversations about like disease control and prognosis, I think it changes how we jump from one treatment methodology to another. So like, what is the true end of the dentition? Like, mm. when do we jump or bail? And that's changed for me. John, you and I were on the phone the other day and I showed you a picture of a case and I said, you know what? I'm a little concerned about belling now. Right. And I said to you, I said, now five years ago, John, if I'd have put this up there on, and showed you the same case, we both agreed we would have jumped to multiple implants in this patient. Right. But we, it's not that we didn't see what we didn't see before. We saw teeth. We saw the restorative conundrum. But we, I just don't think we really gave teeth all their due. And here we are in the hills of the greatest implant meeting in the world, the greatest clinicians. And we're hearing this continual rumble, I feel like, that has been permeating the implant world. Teeth are not implants, and we need to be very careful how far we push our patients into something that's not a tooth. Well, and, and I think the, the promises that we make, we have to be very careful when it gets to implants. I think, you know, with teeth, there are a lot of things that we know. And we know mm -hmm. because <clears throat> we've had so many years of data. Um, and with implants, don't get me wrong, I mean, we have tons of data as well, but there are some things we're discovering all the time uh, with implants. And of course, the designs are, are changing. Right. and the technology is evolving and there's so much good that that has done but how much how much do we sometimes skip over what's possible with teeth <clears throat> and i think you know sometimes we we need to take a break and we need to talk about okay what what can we do in order to get this patient to 100 years old and i think right. that is the thing that i've taken from what spear has done for me what spear education has done for me is it's not a matter of saying implants are not the way to go. In fact, many times that is where we end up going, and it's great. But I think it's taught us to say, okay, look at the age of the patient, look at the long-term prognosis, rely on sometimes those time-tested prosthodontic concepts and pros perio, perio pros type of concepts, and realize that there are things we can do here that can give the patient a really good situation and, and give us more time before it's time to make that jump because they may not be what the question is Wes what do you do if you do a full arch implant restoration on a 30 year old where is that patient going to be in 20 years in 40 years in 60 years 
Uh, we don't really know the answer to those questions. We know some of that data, but it's limited. And we certainly know better what we can do with teeth. So I think that's something I'm looking forward to talking to Frank about. Uh, and, and two, as, as he has evolved in his thinking about uh, dentistry over the years, which I appreciate about him is that he's always open to new ideas and not stuck doing it one way. I think the um, question that I want to ask... Where are we ask, going? I think yeah, it's going to be interesting to talk about. I think I want to ask this question. At How has your treatment methodology changed for this patient, the congenitally missing lateral? Mm. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Right? It's a great I discussion. I mean, that's the... That's the one, right? That's the young girl that you see as a teenager. You know, she's in ortho, yep. and you're setting her up for implants, right? I mean, like, I've been there, man. I mean, we're doing it. Yes. And and now, and I had a patient last year, the year before last, that I, that I sent to ortho that we had talked about, a young, young woman in her uh, late 20s, Okay, and sent to ortho, okay, and turns out after ortho, she gets the teeth in the right place. She, she needs implants, some grafting to make everything just look just perfect. Got a great smile. So we go for insurance approval, and insurance, like, denies coverage for implants. Hmm. So it made us step back. And I started to look at the other prosthodontic options here for this patient. And we ended up doing these winged, you know, uh, cantilever marital bridges. Yeah, yeah. With these all ceramic restorations because our bonding's so daggone good. Right. And like minimally invasive preps on the distal of the canines or the mesial of the canines. Mm -hmm. And I saw her the other day and it's been like two years since we finished the case. And I, I looked at her and I said, you know what? you may not ever need to have dental implants. She's like, I know. She was like, yeah. I think we've saved ourselves a surgery. Right. And it looks amazing. But it took some prosthodontic knowledge sure, and predictability in setting up the bite, making sure everything was correct, that, like you said, I think that this journey through, and we have to credit Spear Education because they've helped us become the clinicians we are yeah. to be able to think and talk like and this. It really, in the end, I think that that what what the what we've talked about is we used to say we used to look at implants because we thought here here's and, and you know I'm going to be talking when I when I teach next time, and I haven't even shared this with you, but I'm going to be talking about the Dunning. Kruger effect. Okay, so like, let me geek out just a second. Wow. <laughs> so the so Dunning good, man. Kruger effect. If you just stop right now and Google that, yep, you're gonna see a graph, and it is the graph of experience, and and so so essentially on on the on the x axis is your experience, on the y axis is your confidence, <laughs> and. What happens is initially you have very little experience, but your confidence is very high. And, and, and on the graph, that's called Mount Stupid. Mount <laughs> Stupid. It's on so top good, of man. Mount Stupid. And Some the idea of you is, right now, like... Yeah, you're like, this is easy. I got this. Right. This is easy. And I think and that's with everybody at, at these new implant courses. Yeah, man. everybody, go. you go to the implant course. You're like, I got this. I know everything I need to know. You come back, and, you're the expert. Right. And, and you want to put in every implant you can. And I think that's where Wes and I were years and years ago. We knew what we thought we knew about implants, and we st and some of it was correct. But, but we were on Mount Stupid a little bit. And then as your experience goes on, you get to a point at the dip, which they call the Valley of Despair, which is where you're going, I will never get this. Things are You're having problems, you're experiencing mm -hmm. failures, complications, and you feel like I will never, ever understand what's really going on. And then with more experience, your, your level of confidence goes back up to, to, to the point where you say, you know what, this is actually easy again, because now I know where I'm, what I'm really doing. And I think that as we have figured out, implants used to be more of like almost a bailout. If you didn't know exactly what to do with teeth, oh, well, let's just put implants in. And you didn't really understand that you, you really didn't have enough experience and experience complications enough to know that there's good and bad about that decision. And I love this. The thing I love about this meeting is you're going to have point counterpoint. Love it. You're going to have, you know, high level prosthodontists, high level surgeons, high level, you know, implant advocates. And then you're going to have people who are kind of pushing back against that and talking about, you know, what can we do to, to try to, you know, make things last longer. 
And I think that we're going to be talking to a lot of people this meeting, and that may come up time and time again. Uh, and so it's great to see you know, some of these spear education folks out there at the AO representing that, that kind of systematic approach of, of trying to get people from you know, where they are right now, which might be Mount Stupid, you know, hey, I'm, I'm so implants are everything or, you know, I, right. I know everything I need to know to finally getting to the point where you go, OK, you, you've been through the complications, the failures, the problems. Now we're coming on the other side. And that brings us right to this show, Wes. That's right. Because man. in zero bone loss concepts, this is basically if you look at it, it's chronicling the author's transition from thinking kind of in a simple way to uh, and w not knowing why we were losing bone really at the beginning just kind of seeing the bone loss and seeing the problems and seeing the complications and thinking well it's not my implants you know it's not me it's got to be something with my implant design or the, I need to switch companies or I need to now we go full circle and we start to get to the point where we're starting to see what really matters so after a, a brief moment with our sponsor we're going to get back to you with zero bone loss concepts and uh, start right into the coverage of that. So we'll see you back in a minute. This is Justin Goodbrand. Here is today's tip. Hey guys, it's Justin Goodbrand here with Financially Simple. Now that you have improved your sales process, you're ready to dive into the world of marketing. Marketing is essentially targeting and capturing the attention of your practice's ideal patient. Marketing also educates your prospective patient so they're ready to engage you for your services with little hesitation. For example, when Apple created the iPhone, marketing compelled people to stand in line for days just to have the newest gadget. If you have any questions about how to increase the value of your practice or how to potentially double your net worth every three to five years, reach out to us via FinanciallySimple.com and we'll be more than happy to help you. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to FinanciallySimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit HeritageInvestor.com, FinanciallySimple.com for additional information. Well, John, here we are. I feel like we're coming to the conclusion of the book. We've got probably a few more episodes to finish this out. We're in the midst of the prosthetic. And let's talk about what factors are going to influence bone loss when it comes to multiple implants and splinting them together. We're talking about mm. fixed partial dentures. We're talking about the AKA bridge. We're talking about if you're one of those guys that likes to splint your implants, well, you need to listen up. Right here it is. What factors yep. are going to affect the bone loss around your implants or the bone remodeling, maybe the bone growth, if um, we're going to start splinting our restorations together? So, John, you and I, like, I think we've kind of learned some stuff from this chapter, oh, right? Yeah. Oh, and there's yeah. some stuff that I was doing. I didn't even know why I was doing it. And I'm reading this, and I'm thinking, oh, okay, right? Yep. That makes sense. It makes sense. So, John, talk a little bit about why someone, for the most part, would want to hook multiple implants together. Yeah, I, I, we know that you know when we're doing implant fixed partial dentures, implant bridges, <clears throat> um, we've got to deal with how do we how do we handle the connection from the abutment to the implant mm -hmm. how important is passivity of fit mm. um, and then how do we best connect multiple units to ensure a passive fit number one number two what type of abutment are we using mm -hmm. are we engaging the hex the taper both uh, how important is the is the uh, impression design? So let's kind of dive into this a little bit. Let's, you know, one of the things he sets the stage with is the thought being at the beginning to, to maintain bone, that we want to try to have a passive fitting restoration. And, and this is maybe not the primary most important factor with bone loss, but we certainly want to have a biomechanically stable connection that is not moving around. Well, John, and the we best way to have a passive fit restoration is just mill two custom abutments and submit it in. You got the slop, slop gap, 
right? Well, that's, yeah. So he talks about that and he says that's kind of been the thought process is that that, that the cement can eliminate the, um, I mean, the, uh, uh, that can make it more passive. Like the whole live advent of the custom abutment that the Atlantis concept that was developed right. years ago, we can now mill titanium and not cast gold restorations any longer. We can save you money and time and make all your implants parallel and then cement on your restoration just like you do any crown and bridge restoration. Yep. <clears throat> well, and I think I think that that's the, you know the idea of the cement acting as a shock absorber, mm. right, or filling the gap, you know, and, and, the, and as he says later in the chapter, he says, these claims are accurate when cemented restorations are compared with cast screw retain crowns, cemented are certainly more passive. However, recent changes in fabrication of screw retain restorations have changed the situation. The introduction of milling mm -hmm. rather than casting has dramatically reduced uh, screw loosening. Um, and also we know now that we're, cementing um, abutments or we're cementing crowns over our screw retained tie bases. That's right. That is giving us another, uh, it's kind of, it's meaning, it's essentially meaning that both of them have that advantage. So we kind of look at cement and it used to be the, the solution to this, but we're realizing now how important eliminating cement could be. So if our goal is to try to eliminate cement, we have to try to achieve a passive fit as best we can using good impression techniques. And so, so we could get into the high weeds on this, but we'll, we'll, we'll start here. He begins the chapter talking about um, how he takes cement or how he takes impressions with, with, uh, for a screw retain bridge. And he talks about how he will try to determine whether a, an engaging impression coping or non-engaging is the way to go. So in other words, does, does he use an impression part that engages the hex, or does he use an impression part that does not? And he uses a simple test of connecting them together with some autopolymerizing resin, mm -hmm. and then seeing if he can lift it off with his finger with, with no uh, friction, essentially, or no resistance. And if he feels resistance with the hex, then he's gonna move to a non-engaging type of impression coping. So in the impression step, he's trying to eliminate as much uh, of that uh, misfit that he could have happen from a from a poor and if you're following outcome. along in the book right now, there's an excellent demonstration or actually a figure <clears throat> where he shows what he's doing on page 186 and yep. how he loots those two together. Listen, this takes seconds, right? Yeah. And let me tell quick. you something else right now, okay? Because let me tell you something else right now, John. <laughs> yeah. Okay? I don't know. I got serious right here. Yeah, that was real. Serious. This is where you're going to push the limits of your implant company's parts, right here. Yep. Right, because not everybody has this stuff. Right, not everybody has non-engaging abutments. That means you're going to have to learn how to cut hexes off. Not right. ever have. Not everybody has non-engaging, even impression copings. Right, open right, tray, right. and even a good open tray impression coping. To much less just an open tray, yep. right? So this is where you're going to push your company's like implant inventory parts list, right? And let me tell you what: don't just go thinking that you can go buy some off OEM part, like some mm -hmm. third party, and make this kind of thing work. Because the inaccuracies start right here, right? It doesn't yep. start with the model pour. It doesn't even start with the impression. The inaccuracies, John, they start right here with you trying these in the mouth. Absolutely. And I think once, once we, if we can eliminate or reduce, we shouldn't say eliminate, but if we can reduce inaccuracies from the impression using uh, the right type of coping, whether it be engaging or non-engaging. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, now there is an advantage, as he talks about, if you're using longer span uh, FPDs with say multiple abutments of having at least one of those be engaging of the hex because it helps you when you're delivering the restoration right. to have something that indexes the position. Something actually um, I picked up right on this is like, you know, you got five or six units that you're engaging. You right. know? Put if you one just of, engage one. Just engage one. Yeah, right. if you can engage one, it's going to give you an easier time at, at delivery uh, to, to be able to lock that into place. But at, right after he talks about that, he immediately goes into a segment on tie bases, mm -hmm. on the actual 
uh, abutment that we're using to connect to the implant and to the bridge. And he kind of debunks the idea that we have to have a hex. And this is something that kind of challenged my thinking mm -hmm. because I have always thought, well, I'm okay without a hex, but I like to have a hex. And why I think was because I remember being told somewhere, and this is one of those things you kind of don't even know why you do it, but that you would have less stress on the screw if you had a hex because it would be anti-rotation. But he kind of debunks that saying, hey guys, we used non-engaging UCLA castable abutments for years and years before we had- And that was on um, X-Hex too, I bet. Right, it could be X-Hex, it could be old internal hex, and we never had issues. So what really matters here is the accuracy of the impression, the model, all of those things, and your anti-rotation should be based on the design of a fixed partial denture. The screw really shouldn't be doing any work that would compromise your, your and then I started looking at, I started thinking about that, and I thought, Wes, I've got all kinds of these non-engaging, old, like say in my region, it's Zimmer, uh, internal hex. I got a ton of old Zimmer, Calcitec, you know, whatever you want to call the company over the years, with non-engaging UCLA's. Dude, that doesn't even have like a internal taper much of any way, you know, right. no conical seal or anything. And, and, and yet you're not having prosthetic not having complications. Screw loosening. And the reason why is because you add an accurate impression, right? right? You, you had, had accurate impressions. You had good and, parts. And you had good so stuff. That, that starts to get us thinking that the hex, if, if you're relying on your hex to try to not have screw loosening, you probably, if you've had problems on, let me say it this way. If you've had problems with screws coming loose on your screw retained bridges that, that are non-engaging, it's probably that you didn't have passive fit. Hey, some of you are I'll, using cheap impression material and cheap parts. Ooh. I'm just going to say it. Mm. You know, and I'm going yeah. and, 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 and I'm just going to say it. You're going to see complication. Right. Right. If you want to use the generic brand stuff, use it for your crowns. Right. But don't use it for this stuff. Like yeah, this is where it matters the most. Yeah. And I think that that's where, you know, if we can accept, and he, he goes into great lengths to talk about um, that it that it's not important to have the hex in these restorations. Let me say this one more time. Yeah. This book has some of the best images yeah, that you possibly can imagine. Like the photography and the examples are next level. Mm -hmm. Like yep. hats off to the job that they did putting this together because it is impressive. It's impressive. Yeah. Well, so if you can get to the point of being comfortable with using non-engaging for your fixed parcel dentures, then you, you, it opens up a whole new world, right? Mm, mm. Because you start to go, okay. And he uses the example of Strauman. He says, okay, if I'm using Strauman and I'm okay with non-engaging, that means I've got 15 degrees of freedom in the Strauman bone level which means up to 30 degrees of implant angulation difference is possible with a direct connection to the implant without any type of transmucosal abutment. I think or, that's a real anything. important concept to understand here. And some of you have been asking us for, you know, what our recommended implants are for uh, particular situations. And you look at a, the advantage of a Strauman implant in this particular situation is that it has, if you're looking at this on YouTube, if it has a 15 degree angle, right coming up out of the internal conical connection and you have another implant setting beside that that's off angle it's like your crown prep upside down right, right? that's how to think about it if you prepped a crown or two crowns to do teeth for a bridge and you prepped it at a 15 degree angle well will that draw right right all all yeah it'll draw <laughs> that's a big deep that's a big wide uh you know, internal connection at 15 degrees and you put two of those together, man, you could be, you have 30 degrees of freedom. Yeah. To so get so that if you to get passive. So if you get down to kind of what people, like you say, Wes, have been asking us about is, well, okay, so what does this mean for brass tacks? This means that now you need to look at what implant system you're using and you need to look at what is the connection and what is the, what are the degrees of freedom that you have to work with? And if you have a Strauman or you have, let's say, a Zimmer internal hex or BioHorizon, something that has relatively wide angle that you're working with, you can probably do some splinting 
direct to implant with non-engaging. But if you have the type of implant that he talked about kind of preferring for subcrestal bone level type of implants with a Morse taper connection, which is a three degree, three to five degree connection, now we start to get a lot more limited in splinting. And this is what Wes and I have talked about a lot in the last year together off air is if you have the same implant system that gives you probably the most stable, according to this book, the most stable bone at a subcrestally placed position in a, say, a thin tissue situation where you're driving the implant deeper. Yeah, an immediate. Now, if you want to do a bridge, uh, you, you're going you're gonna to start having to be, you're more limited because you can't, I mean, you only got six degrees to play with. Right, because here's what happens is that he, he goes into this next and he says there's tension Mm. right? There's tension. Mm -hmm. And so I experienced this on a recent case that I took off because this patient lost an adjacent tooth and we were just going to extend a cantilever to the mesial off of a three unit um, or a two unit um, fixed partial denture, two implants splinted together, cantilever to the mesial one tooth. And when I took, when I, when I took this, the composite out of the occlusal surfaces, and I went down in there, I said, hmm, one of these screws is not super tight. Like, I was able to mm -hmm. just back it off. But then I pulled the abutment off, or the, out, the abutment and crown, and I looked at the abutment, and guess what I saw on the abutment? Micro-etching. Mm. So what's that? That's micro-movement, yeah. right? So guess where I, where I went wrong, Right is I did not splint the impression copings together, right? That's mm. number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, whenever I did splint them, I didn't, when I didn't splint them, I wasn't able to check for pass, you know, passive fit or a tension-free environment. So mm -hmm. it's on me. So yep. when I'm redoing this, thank the goodness, right, that we, we did redo it for this patient because she needed another tooth, we were able to, we did some extra stuff because of this book. <laughs> yeah. I changed the way I did that case. And yep. now I have a true passive connection. And this particular implant design, it had an internal connection of 11 degrees. So that mm -hmm. means I had 22 degrees of freedom. So sure, it was two implants side by side. I had plenty of degrees of freedom to be able to provide a tensionless environment for passive fit, John. So... So if you have an implant, though, that has a super tight connection, like a three-degree Morse taper, right? what do you do Man, if your desire is a splintum? Well, you have to go to the next, the next part of the book. You have to go to a multi-unit or transmucosal type of abutment, a conical abutment, whatever you want to call it. And what these are, these are abutments that we've all seen before on, say, all on four, all on six types of cases where... You have a, an abutment that allows for you to engage the the conical connection. Old school guys will call these a second stage abutment, right? Yeah, exactly. Secondary abutment, and so you're 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 placing this abutment into the implant, and then you have a secondary screw, which is going to hold your restoration in place. And of course, when you do this, you now end up with a huge amount of degrees of freedom. You can yeah. you can. You can correct for all kinds of angulation problems, but these were created for all on four, uh, mm -hmm. you know, full arch situations. And just the other day, John, I, I I was finishing a case, and I said, you know what? If I went back, you know, I'd already started this, and I'd put um, multi unit abutments on this case. Mm -hmm. I think that I would do it differently now because what he says here, John, is he said there's no evidence to support that adding a secondary abutment mm -hmm. will reduce bone loss. But in fact, there's evidence to suggest that you're going to have more prosthetic complications. Yeah, because more you complications because you, you, you have two screws. You have a screw that is small that you can only torque to 10 to 15 newtons and uh, you, you have or newton centimeters. And you, of course, have now another part you have to buy, which we didn't, which he doesn't talk about, but it adds cost. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is there an advantage? And I think that what we can say is that there is an advantage uh, uh, for these really tight connections, these Morse taper connections. But this gets us, and, and again, Wes, we don't want to give it all away, but this got us thinking about 
implants, and, and does that mean that you need to have two types of implants in your practice or more? One that you use for the deep subcrestal placement types of situations, and then one that you use for splinting. And, and we're just gonna leave that out there and just say, you know, we don't have all the answers, but it is an interesting thought because do you want to be using these secondary abutments with the potential for complications in your very tight, because he's right, you know, there's no advantage to this except if you can't achieve passive fit because your connection is so deep and, and tight essentially with degrees of freedom. Mm. So I've used these rest. I've used these types of abutments many, many times with implants that have these really tight connections because of necessity. But should we be doing that, Wes, or should we be choosing an implant for these splinting situations that allows us to go direct to the implant by having more yeah. degrees of freedom in the connection? What what used to be considered maybe <laughs> a bad connection, like say external hex, right. for instance. Should we be going back to external hex implants for our splinted restorations? Well, or? it's probably a knee-jerk reaction in a sense that we probably don't want X hex. Right, right. But, but I want to stir the pot a little bit. But I think that what you're saying is, right, if we take all of the factors into play of what causes bone loss and what he's saying here, right, is that we want no movement when our implants are placed close or below the bone, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That there is a risk. And if you don't have a <laughs> passive fit restoration, meaning that it fits like it's supposed to fit, tension-free, then you're going to introduce a micro gap that mm -hmm. could promote bone loss. And that's the crux of this, is that we want a tension-free environment it's going to be, you're going to have less prosthetic failures, less prosthetic complications, but you're going to have to start thinking about the type of implant you're placing. Now, let me tell you what I, what I, what I know. I've been placing implants for 15 years, and I used to be, you know, guides really were not, other than poor man's guides, you know, were not a part of my practice. Even in, and I was the guy that was asking for, the paralyzation pins, right? And just to freehand parallels before we had, you know, guides. And then CTs yeah. came and I jumped on board the CT. We did, you know, I was pioneering that whole thing and pushing the limits and just doing some cool stuff. And so what this led me to do to say, and John, I told you this, is that I guide 100% of the time when I'm doing more than one implant side by mm. side. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because of this right here. Because you never know when. Like if it's two implants in a quadrant and they're not going to be hooked together, if it's like, you know, but down the road they possibly could be, I'm going to yep. do everything I can to make sure those implants are pretty daggone par parallel. Now, what if you can't parallel them? Because in the anterior, that's a real problem, right? right? And we're going to talk about some stuff coming up in this next chapter, I think, that really can boggle your mind, you know? Right. Because if you can't parallel your implants... Well, that's a problem, especially with these deeper connections. And one would right. say, jump on what John said and just use a X hex and you can parallel just about anything. Right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know that that's the right the right answer. And I don't know I don't think that's what he's saying here because no, you, no. there's a happy medium right. of what we're But trying maybe we to should achieve. be looking at implants that have a little bit more a little bit more give, a little bit more flexibility. When we're splinting them. When we're splinting them. When we're splinting right. and, them. And, of right. course, still following the recommendations in the earlier chapters about realizing that you're having a trade-off, Wes. The trade-off is if you choose an implant yep. that has no more taper and you're doing that because you're going to splint, well, now you're also losing some stability of the connection subcrestal. Mm -hmm. So if you're splinting with bridges and you want to be able to go direct to the implant, you probably should be thinking about not placing that implant way subcrestal because you don't have a Morse taper. And I think that's what's brought us back to sometimes just having to rely on these transmucosal type of abutments because we like the idea of having a nice connection that's stable 
subcrestal. You know who this so upsets? I, you know who this upsets <clears throat> more than anybody? Is the general dentist that's placing implants that really can only afford one system. Hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Or, makes it harder. And I'm not saying afford, but it does make it harder because maybe you, you can't just, you don't want to stock the extra inventory, right? Because that gets expensive and, and you have to train. Mm-hmm. And, and in the midst of surgery, I'm just telling you, decisions are being made that could impact the bone around the implant down the road. If this is a patient, this is where we kind of come back to our monologue. If this is a patient that is slowly losing their teeth, mm-hmm. right, and we're transitioning from teeth to implants, which happens, right? I mean, we do these cases. Then what type of implant are you placing, right? And if you're doing mm-hmm. immediates, like, how do you navigate that, right? And this book kind of, if you grasp the concepts of this book, it helps mm-hmm. you navigate, hey, look, if I'm going to splint or I'm thinking about splinting down the road, I may want to choose this type of implant, this type of restoration. And that, and I think that leads right into the, the closing thoughts on this chapter. And we saw, we saw Lincovicious present yeah. at the AO and the prosthetics forum. This I think was it was really, last year. really good. And he, you know, everybody's talking about, uh, you know, showing these nice all on four, all on six cases. <clears throat> and he gets up and kind of says, Hey, just so everybody knows that's not what I do. If I can avoid it, I'm right. trying to move away because he is citing research showing the prosthetic complications of these splinted restorations compared to f- smaller segments. And his preference, as he says here, is he would prefer for restorations not to cross the arch. And he would prefer more implants, smaller segments, more fixed partial dentures versus hybrid type of restorations. And he has some pretty compelling data to back that mm-hmm, up. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that what we have to take from this is, yes, we potentially could. And But but I like the fact he justifies why he thinks this is. He thinks mm-hmm. it's because of what's been described in the chapter. Lack of passive impressions, inaccuracies of larger bridges, tension caused by splinting non-parallel implants. Those are all things we can run into in the all-on-four, all-on-six type, type of restoration. And the more implants we're trying to splint the more issues that we have. So Mm -hmm. take that for what you will. It doesn't mean those restorations don't work, but it means that you've got to be on your game in a bigger and bigger way the more implants that you're trying to splint so that we achieve less prosthetic complications. Well, John, this has been a great chapter. I think as we move on here into the next chapter, we're talking about, as we've been talking about, tie bases and things like that, but what type of abutment Mm. should we be using, right? We're going to be talking a little bit about abutment alternatives in chapter 15. I think, again, the advent of the custom abutment, right, was Mm -hmm. a big deal in dentistry. You know, we go Mm -hmm. from the UCLA. Now, UCLA was basically an abutment that you waxed with full contoured wax and you cast it, right? You put it Mm -hmm. in the old... The, the centrifuge and uh, yep. right always the nervous time when you're investing your wax and and like <laughs> you're praying that this works and right you know the inaccuracies of that John super inaccurate I can remember some of my first bar wrapped in acrylics they were cast gold and we would try them in and we would segment them just go ahead and plan yep. on it and we would duralay yep. pattern resin the pieces back together and then send it back and then have them solder solder. and solder it. And so the thing about, the thing that's changed is milling, right? Milling machines have allowed us to do some amazing things. And as they've gotten more affordable, we've seen a lot of milling machines come on the market that can do some awesome stuff. So Mm -hmm. the stock abutment, right, that's been used for years, and I lamented about, um, as an early implant clinician, but especially if I was always cement retained, right? I I would just always ask for a a custom abutment. Luckily in 2004, when I started my practice, Atlantis and there was custom abutments and we were still doing some UCLA was just coming up on the market, but I was taught UCLA for single units. And what it allowed you to do was raise those margins, do more of a natural tooth contour to your abutments. Plus you increase that abutment uh, surface area, which allowed your crown to stay on, um, 
easier. It just made things more cleansable for the patient, and it looked more tooth-like. Well, stock abutments, the bad thing about those is the margin, if you're placing subcrestal implants and you're going to try to cement that on, that's like three millimeters maybe deeper and approximately right. down below the gum line. Big problem. And, and you know one thing he brings up here in, in part of this chapter, he says it's unknown yet on some of these some of these uh, tie bases where you're cementing the restoration outside the mouth, right? Mm -hmm. There's a cement margin right there. Mm -hmm. And if you, they're looking at, does that cause a harboring of bacteria which could lead to inflammation where that is yep. so far down on some of these tie bases below the tissue, John? I think custom abutments have changed dentistry, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Especially and, I, and he goes and he goes into talking about what type of abutment design should we choose if we're trying to achieve a uh, proper cement mm -hmm. situation and a proper screw retained. And and I think, you know, first we should talk about what is necessary if you have to cement. Let me ask you because this, John, before you get into that. Yeah, yeah. How how many of your posterior restorations are you having to cement right now? I mean zero. Yeah. So it's the anterior we're talking about. Right, yeah, it's the anterior because we really shouldn't be having to cement in the posterior unless you, you have a real big problem with your implant surgeon, mm -hmm. you know, or, your own, or if you're doing your own surgery, you know, you need to, you need to, mm -hmm. we need to work on that because it, it shouldn't be So in the issue. anterior. Yeah, in the anterior, what do we do if we need to cement, uh, and if, if we've exhausted all other options? Well, We've got to decide where our margin placement is going to be with these custom abutments. And based upon the earlier chapters, in terms of cement removal, we know that he proved earlier on through some studies that the only way to effectively remove all the cement was with a 0.5, a 0.5 millimeter sub gingival margin. That's the furthest down you could go and still be able to reliably remove cement. So he's advocating for that being the deepest margin that you would place on a custom abutment in the anterior. So you're saying 500 Point. microns. Yeah, yeah. So and, how and accurate? So, how, accurate so how, your... how good can our impression be and how much tissue change do you have? And, you know, we, we don't want to get again into the high weeds, but you should, if you really want to go next level, um, to learn how to make anterior restorations, you'll find this in every major textbook, every PROS program. You'll all find it at RDI, which we teach it is making a customized impression coping. Essentially, this means that you're going to use your provisional restoration mm -hmm. uh, and you're going to copy that uh, subgingival contour into your impression coping. And there's whole techniques that describe how to do that. So even if you do that though, Wes, and you, you have a customized impression coping and you take an accurate impression, it's still difficult to not displace the tissue in some way you don't want when you inject that light body down into the sulcus to try to capture that. And, and so his solution, which I found ingenious, was to have the lab make a replica abutment that's plastic of mm -hmm. some kind mm -hmm. and try that in and look at the margin. And then modify and then the margin. Modify the margin intraorally and send it back to the lab for them to redesign the abutment based upon that before making the definitive abutment. I thought that was an ingenious That's idea. That's pretty awesome. And you might think, well, watch this, watch this make a difference. You know, is this really is this really that important? Well, if you want to have zero bone loss around your implants, right? Right? It's really getting important. And where yeah, you want to take the cement off or not, you know, so and that's pretty you this, much John. what he's saying. How many periodontal disease patients do you have implants in that you have cement retained restorations? Too many. Too many. Right? Because in, he pretty much says that you really shouldn't be doing cement retained restorations in periodontal disease patients. Now, that doesn't yeah. mean active. That means whenever. Ever. If they've ever had periodontal disease, that the cement is so much of a yeah. risk factor. Yeah, they're too susceptible. They're too susceptible. Because it's so basically what we're saying is right is you got to use some other fancy stuff. Right. So you could try this technique in a patient with no perio or if you want to really, you know, be a hero and you think you can get all the cement off, then this is a great technique. But 
But I think, you know, very quickly after seeing the complexity involved in that, we kind of step back and go, well, let's try to avoid that. Let's try to avoid cementing in the anterior. And his other approach that he uses is um, having like a telescopic abutment type mm -hmm, of idea. Mm -hmm. You know, you make an abutment where the margin is purposefully elevated above the tissue two or three millimeters, and then you make a crown which is going to cement to that that's the same shade. Of course, he goes into the fact there's problems with hiding the cement margin. But let's assume for a moment here that we're going to just move away from cement, Wes. Mm -hmm. So what are our options? And he goes into the one that's recently become more popularized, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is an, angu an angulated screw channel access, right. which means that, and you guys have probably heard about this, but if you haven't, it's having the lab mill in an, an, an angulated screw channel into the back of your crown to basically shift the exit point of the screw toward the lingual by somewhere around 15 to 30 degrees depending on the system and then using a specialized driver that engages this screw at an angle but can still achieve the torque that's necessary to hold it. And I think this is a good solution but I think uh, and he doesn't talk a lot about the negative with this. Uh, what I've found with this is that there's a problem with thickness on the lingual because mm -hmm. if you move that screw channel access lingually, you have to still have enough abutment wall thickness in order to achieve strength. And there's also a so, problem with some of these deeper conical connections. It's just not possible. You can't. Yeah, exactly. It's just that you can't mill it in there. You can't mill it in there. And so, so, there's a, so it's good if you have a, the perfect scenario for it. Um, I think it can be great. I, I've done a few, a handful of these cases uh, to try it out. And so far, I haven't had any problems. Well, why not just use composite for, to operate the hole? Like, just do it right through the facial. That'd be interesting. Well, I mean, he shows that. Yeah, it'd be interesting, right? Yeah, he, shows a train, he shows a train wreck of a patient here that's going to lose their teeth. And, yeah, and, and essentially, and do that. they do a crown and bridge style. Mm -hmm. And he operates, operates the hole with composite. And the patient just yeah. accepts that. Yeah, you just accept that. Right? You, you know what you're going to be do... doing. You're going to be polishing that every time they come in. So what's the big deal? Right. right? You could also do a lingual set screw, which he doesn't talk about. Yeah, we did those. Kind of... And those are, those, are, those are interesting. I've got a yeah, few of those out work, there. they can work, but yeah. same thing. You can have bulk issues, mm -hmm. and you can have you know small screw that you're dealing with hey, now. There's no you know? perfect answer, right? It's really there's just We're kind of limited right now, you know? But he does have a great decision tree, which I like. He it's says, good. you know... If you've got perfect position of the implant three-dimensionally, well, we can do whatever we want. We're going to screw retain it perfectly. If we're not where we want to be, then we have to decide. Are we going to go with a supra, purposefully supra gingival margin, say in the posterior? That's very doable. Or in the anterior, we're going to go with one of these 0.5 millimeter sub gingival margins, which means maybe a replica abutment. Mm -hmm. Or are we going to go to an angulated screw channel or a lingual set screw or something of that nature? And... Yeah, there's no perfect answer when your implant is not in the perfect position here. I I think you have to really come to terms right now if you're listening to this, if you really believe cement's a problem. Because you're going to start thinking about it more after reading this book, right? I mean, even more now, right? Yeah, even yeah. more now, I think I'm considering other things, right? Right. I mean, and that's okay if you don't believe, but there's just like overwhelming evidence yep. by multiple clinicians. It's not just Tomas, right? No, 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 no. I mean, Chandra Wadwani. Right. I mean... Yeah, you got plenty of people it's, out there it's who just, know this is a problem. Yep. Well, I, I think, Wes, you know, this is, this is one of those, those chapters that makes you really think about, you know, really the last two chapters. I mean, these are things that challenge the way we think, and I think they just define kind of the current standard. Mm -hmm. You know, what should we be doing? What shouldn't we be doing? Um, I think it, it really challenges us to come back to the, the basics of understanding three-dimensional implant position. And now that we have our, our early chapters on placement, surgical placement, we, we know that if we place an implant ideally with the thought of, like you said earlier, are we going to splint this? Mm. Where is the screw going to be exiting? Let's make sure that we don't put ourselves in a situation where we have to make these compromises. And maybe it, it, tends, it tends us more toward augmentation. 
you know, yeah. in certain areas. I mean, both soft it tissue and hard tissue. It definitely pushes you into the CT realm and the three-dimensional restorative-driven surgery, right? Yep. I mean, it definitely makes you say, hey, see, do implants? <laughs> I mean, really makes you think, whoa, back up, let's do a little treatment planning. Let's just not jump right into the production Right. Yep. Let's just yep. not drop 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 some titanium today. Right. I mean. Yep. Let's and just... I think too, it, it's hopefully going to get you thinking about, you know, even simple thing as how you're going to take your impressions differently. Ah, Making sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. And and one other thing, while we're on the subject of this, Wes, I just want to cover because we 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 haven't really talked a lot about it, is scanning, implant yeah. impressions and scanning. Hey, it's not even um, in here. It's not even in there. It's not even in zero bone loss concepts. That's interesting. And I know I know Tomas uses scanners. Right. But it's not right. in, it's not in this book, John. It's not in there. Hmm, so I, I wonder go what back. your buddy. I wonder what your buddy, <laughs> Mark Ludlow, Dr. Yep. Mark Ludlow, would have to say Who's speaking at the AO, by the who's way? Who's speaking at the AO would have to say about a full arch scanning protocol that's validated. Without, Ooh. without using cement as a slop gap measure. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. I don't call it cement gap anymore yeah. because I call slop. it slop gap. It's the slop factor. It's the slop gap, guys. So I wonder yep. why it's not in here. Yeah, because well, if you, I, I, I want to go back two years ago when um, Encode <laughs> came out. I just had a phone and, call from a dear friend. Yeah, that, that he I said mean, that. It's imploding. <laughs> yeah. And and it doesn't mean that it's not a good idea. No, it's because a great it's idea. a great idea and it and it really helped pave the way towards scan bodies being more understood and accepted and good on Biomet 3i and and uh, 3M early kind of worked with them to try to develop a a scanning digital pl- a pathway to make these restorations even though it was super convoluted. They did it. But for multiple units, Carl Drago, who was Biomet 3i's, you know, lab, they, he wrote the book for them on lab stuff. Well, he he published a paper with Ed McGlumphy at Ohio State saying it wasn't good enough that that scanning using ENCODE wasn't good enough for bridges, and he recommended he recommended sec doing a, a framework try-in and sectioning on and sectioning on every single so one. So when at least we doing met a when we met Brad, the dental lab guy. We were talking because we live in three I country, right? Yep. And we were asking him, like, because we had had troubles with it, you and I. Yeah. yeah. And and uh, we asked Brad, the dental lab guy, and his brother about what they thought about Encode, and they just laughed because they right. said we couldn't make it work. <clears throat> right. Well, I remember the discussion with Drago, and he was saying that when he tried to figure out they were using glue to glue the analogs in and it was like this called robocast so called method and he they they were trying to figure out where the inaccuracy was and they and they were going down there and they couldn't even figure out they wouldn't even tell him what the glue was so so like the glue obviously has a polymerization shrink anyway so my, my the point of this and and here we are about to release this for the AO but you know Zimmer Biomet's going to you know, be all over us. Hopefully, maybe they have some new data. So it is that's the, a challenge. The, the title of the whole meeting is "Evolving Technologies yeah. and Implant." So maybe Dentistry. maybe they've made this better. We would love to see I, I, a listen, workflow. Come get us because we are going to do some man on the street stuff. Yeah, if you got a new validated workflow or some data that we haven't seen since show this us. time, show us. And that's We've been why we're talking about Dent Supply. Serona has. Yeah, something. that's why we're talking about Mark because Mark, I think, has been talking with them to try to figure out a way to validate a workflow that we could do a Some digital of you out there say there framework. is validated workflows right there's these people out there you know who they mm-hmm. are you know mm-hmm. they, they, they're out there that are saying hey, i there. got a workflow it works but everybody is using cement to make up some of that you know it right so they're going oh yeah my system works well of course they're using four different softwares three different <laughs> scanners you know and they're and they're like there's yeah. pulling rabbits out of hats but in the end it all comes down to the same thing every single time it's they're they're doing a verification jig. A lot of them are still doing a verification jig, and they're using cement in the end to take up the slot. So, 
John, it's been a well, great episode, we, man. Another uh, yeah. zero bone loss concepts in the book. We've probably got another one in, uh, coming your way right after this to finish up the book. Dental Guys Book Club, in effect. Looking forward to the Academy meeting, right? Yep. And uh, we'll be seeing you there. We're going to be busy, but we are also want you to come. High five us. Yeah. Say hi. Right, because love. we definitely want to know that you know who we are, because that keeps us going. Honestly, yeah, like really, us. you guys have been sending us some encouraging comments. If you haven't sent us something, right? Yep. Don't think that we don't read it. Like I was just reading a a rep from the West Coast, from a mm-hmm. well known implant company, sent us an amazing email, and I know he's listening to this. Yep. And I really appreciate that. We really appreciate you. We look forward to seeing you if you're going to be at the AO. Uh, So any of you guys, please come and say hi. Uh, We'll be there. Uh, We'll be speaking at the Young Clinicians Luncheon, and we're super excited about that. That's Friday at 11, what is 11.30, 11.45-ish? Yeah, it's around lunchtime. Yeah, Yeah, around lunchtime. Um, So... Uh, this has been good. If you if you listen, how people find out about us is if you share, right? Like and subscribe. We're on YouTube. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. Follow us there. Look for the dental guys. Give us a give us a good review. We need you to go on iTunes right now and give us a five star review and tell us why you like the dental guys and maybe why it's changed your practice. Something we might have said, I don't know, right? Because this show's changed my practice, right? Because when you study books and you read and you dive in, it's all about taking it to the next level. John, I'm excited about tomorrow and, and us traveling together. It's gonna be a great time. And so for John, I'm Wes and we are the dental guys. Yeah.